Okay, our next speaker is Dr. Sivashandiran Lakhanathan. Um, he's the lead person, a lead person of the EPA-funded Great Lakes Fish Monitoring and Surveillance Program. His research is focused on emerging contaminants, monitoring, monitoring and removing from air and wastewater using non-thermal plasma catalytic reactors. He has more than 10 years of research experience and has published over 30 articles and two book chapters in peer-reviewed journals. Please join me in welcoming Siva. I thank you all for being here on Saturday at around four o'clock. And it shows the dedication we all have to save the river and to transfer to the future generation. I appreciate and once again, I thank you all. And also I would like to thank um, Save the River board members for giving me this uh, opportunity to talk on <clears throat> the scientific exploration of mercury and emerging, emerging contaminants in Great Lake fish. Mainly, I will uh, talk about the aquatic mysteries and what's happening with these emerging pollutants. So um, initially, I would like to start how, to, uh, how the pollutants enters into the lake. Just brief introduction. And then, oh, I'm sorry, getting confused, yeah. So the fish consumption advisories, that's very important um, regarding the Great Lake Fish Monitoring programs. And then I will talk about the Great Lake Fish Monitoring Surveillance Program history and where we are right now. And then our research activities and facilities uh, at CARES, Clarkson University. I'll just briefly, I'll explain that. And then I will mainly talk about the trends of um, mercury concentration in all Great Lakes and then the legacy persistent organic pollutants in Great Lake fish. And finally, I'll conclude with uh, important remarks. How do pollutant centers into the lake? So why we care about these five Great Lakes? Because, um, oops, yes. So we rely on the Great Lake freshwaters because it also covers about 35, uh, sorry, 95,000 square miles and um, the, uh, it, hold over 20% of edge surface fresh water, and more than 30 million people, roughly 10% of uh, the uh, US and the Canadian people rely on this fresh water. So the, the main reasons for the, how the pollutants enter into the lake, it's a direct discharge from sewage treatment plants, direct discharge from industries, and then uh, uh, non pine sources, and mainly the atmospheric deposition. So I'll explain it why it is very important in a few slides. So this image shows the um, Great Lake drainage basins where we are getting all the pollutants into the Great Lakes. So fish consumption advisories. Um, why do we care about this consumption advisories? Because, oops. So the fish are, we are very much aware that it's a great source of lean proteins and then omega-3 fatty acids. It helps to reduce the inflammation and also improves our heart health. Saying that, if you look at the, the Great Lake um, water and what we have in it, so we do have uh, several pollutants, but we are mainly concerned about the PCBs, mercury, and then chlorinated uh, pesticides, dioxin, and so on. But there are many pollutants, as my colleague discussed this morning, we are identifying several non-target or unidentified uh, pollutants, but we will talk only main, mainly about these five. So the main sensitive populations are pregnant women and women who could pregnant soon and the, the children below age 15. They are mainly affected by these pollutants in uh, the Great Lake fish. So today I will talk about the polychlorinated biphenyls, PCBs. They are prone to human carcinogens and damage the circulatory system, nervous system, immune system, and so on. Similarly, um, the organic organochlorine pesticides, OCPs, also they are carcinogens and they affect the reproductive system and immune system. So we have to uh, worry or take care and think about what we have on our plate on the table. So the Great Lake Fish Monitoring Surveillance Program started um, monitoring different sites of all five Great Lakes. So we choose two sites. The, the rectangular one shows the um, even year and 
and the, the circle one is the odd year. So every year we go to uh, fish, uh, I mean, go to sample all the Great Lakes in two different sites to monitor and compare how the pollutants are, you know, changing trends and increasing or decreasing and so on. This program started uh, back 1970s, and it's a part partnership with Great Lakes, states and tribes and other federal agencies. And uh, in 2004, it's moved to Clarkson University. There we are mainly focusing on the um, including, oh, sorry, the current and emerging contaminants. That's what I'm going to explain in a few slides. So here, briefly, I'll explain what we are doing in Clarkson. Uh, we take fish and try to analyze and understand what's happening in uh, terms of chemistry. So we also measure the mercury and then isotopes. As I mentioned before, legacy, especially the PCBs, OCBs, and PBDEs. And also dioxin, furan, and lipids content. That's very much important to understand the, the PCB and OCB chemistry related to the lipids. I'll explain you in a few minutes. And apart from that, this morning, we also heard about PFAS. Uh, that is uh, poly and perfluorinated alkyl substances. And this is the widely used word um, uh, in, in, in the United States and in, across the world uh, in um, the last 10 years. And it will be the main concern for another two or three decades. We have no idea how long we have to deal with that. But apart from this, um, not only the fish, we also work on the water chemistry. And here we quantify and identify the PFAS present in any groundwater or lake water, anything. And not only just identification and quantification, we also develop some material to trap them or remove them from the water. So especially I'm working on the porous organic polymerics material that will selectively uh, you know, absorb or remove the PFAS from water. Just not only the removal, we also work on the complete destruction from the given water sample. So we work on leach sample to distract the PFAS present in water. I'm not going to talk anything about that. I'm sorry about it. But yeah, this is, these are the two main tools or instrument I use for the fish analysis. This one is called Extriva, where I do all the fish extraction to identify all the chemicals. And this one is called Atmospheric Pressure Gas Chromatography, where um, we develop method to selectively ionize and identify all the PCBs, OCBs, PBD, whatnot. And these two instruments we use for the water chemistry. So this one is called ion chromatography, where we identify, quantify all the inorganic ions. It's very important because these ions will impact the other pollutant concentration and also the aquatic chemistry. And this one uh, is called TQS Altis triple quad mass spectrometer. This is very important tool what we use to quantify the PFAS present in water, fish sample, sediment, whatnot. So all species we get from all great five lakes, we analyze PFAS using this uh, triple quad instrument. So I would like to give a brief intro about the lake of the year, which is proposed by uh, APA. This is very important to understand how the pollutants are getting bioaccumulated into the, the main predator fish. So we start uh, from top to bottom snapshot here. So we start, uh, it is started in 2011 uh, from Lake Superior. So we start from analyzing water, what we have in, in the water sample, uh, dissolved and particulate matters and then phytoplankton, how much pollutants are, the, uh, are present in the phytoplankton, and then it goes on till the main predator fish, lake trout. And in Lake Erie, especially, we uh, uh, analyze the Lake Valley, yeah. So this a small image shows why it is important. So yeah, we analyzed that, not for sure, not shark, but Lake Trout and Lake Valley, uh, that prey, uh, prey on the small fishes, and then that goes to the zooplankton and then the, the phytoplankton. So we wanted to analyze all the chemicals in all different species so that we can understand how one particular pollutant is getting accumulated in particular fish or species. This just to refresh, um, yeah, this is the food chain. Uh, starts from the plantains and then the invertebrates and small fishes like sculpin or smelt and then the main uh, predator fish, bucks, like trout or salmon, and then it comes to us. 
So now let's see some important and data that it might be interesting. Um, the mercury concentration in all great phi lakes uh, fish samples and then the emerging pollutants. So once the mercury, uh, the liquid metal, we all know that. So once it enters into the uh, environment, what happens is that it's been converted into biologically toxic methyl mercury. So it's over here. So methyl mercury by microorganisms found in the soil and in the aquatic environment. Then what happens? Let's see in the next slide. But now I wanted to show why the environment deposition is important for the, uh, you know, lake getting polluted. So only uh, the metal that is liquid in room temperature is mercury. So it has a appreciable vapor pressure, then it can exist significant concentration in the vapor phase. So imagine we keep some uh, mercury drop in the room, so we'll have mercury vapor in the room as well. Then in the atmosphere, it can be transported without any deposition for long distances. So you may, you may think like there is no industry using mercury next to the lake, but it might be 2,000 miles or 100 miles away from the lake. It may get the mercury deposition. And it's not man-made, so it's not biodegradable. So that's very important to take away a point. And this Widely used in uh, in um, Asian days from making paints, pesticides, even dentistry. So one thing is we have to avoid usage of mercury rather than uh, you know removal or decomposing mercury because it's impossible. So this fed shows uh, the atmospheric fed process. This is very important to understand. So we have these primary anthropogenic emissions of mercury then it's getting oxidized uh, to the reactive gaseous methane, as I said in the previous slide, by reacting with ozone, peroxide, or other active radicals what we have in the atmosphere. And then it's been transported to the cloud where it reacts with sulfur dioxide. It's another pollutant, we have to think about it. And then it's getting deposited, sorry, yeah, getting deposited by rain to the soil or to the aquatic system. So if you look at it, it's not going anywhere, it's just, looping into our aquatic system and into the atmosphere and coming back and again and again. Well, so how do we measure it? Um, we have this atomic absorption spectrometry. Um, that's very straightforward, simple tool what we use to measure the total mercury concentration. I'm not going to explain all of them. So we take the fish tissues into the sampler and then it transported to the uh, catalytic converter where it's been oxidized, sorry, reduced to mercury zero and then we selectively trap using this gold amalgamator and then we quantify them accurately. The thing is, this is more uh, accurate, uh, accurate and then more reliable tool and it can measure from PPT parts per trillion to parts per million and we are, none and then we evaluate the system using uh, standard reference material uh, provided by EPA. So not, now we'll see some data. So this graph shows the mercury concentration, nanogram per gram, otherwise PBB, uh, from 2004 to 2015. If you look at the data, uh, we could see clearly two regimes. One is declining and then it stays there. So from 2020, I mean 2004 to 2010, the mercury concentration decreased at the rate of 4% per year. And it's, it's, it's almost nothing, I would say. Um, and then from 2010, it's not going anywhere. The mercury concentration remains constant in all fi fish tissues. This image from EPA shows the concentration of mercury in all different sites. If you look at overall, the mercury concentration from 1999 to 2009, it's not going anywhere. It's staying there itself. So, then we wanted to know what's happening from 2009. So this graph shows the concentration of mercury in PBB for all lakes superior to Lake Ontario um, in 2010. So you could see still we have like 250 PPB of mercury in lake superior fish tissues, especially the predator, uh, I mean, like trout fish. And in 2020, I just compared, um, but still we are in the same place. There's no big difference when you look at in the error bar except the Lake Erie. I've been saying Lake Erie is different. I'll let you know why it is uh, in a few minutes. Then we wanted to know why these lake truths are having a similar or almost same concentration of 250 PBB uh, across the years. 
So we wanted, I mean, we analyzed the mercury in individual fishes, um, like rainbow smelt or lake whitefish and so on, silk blotter as well. So we see the small fishes are having less than 40 PBB of mercury concentration. And due to this uh, food chain, all the lake fruits are getting highly, um, getting accumulated uh, and the concentration goes up to 250 PBB. So the takeaway point is we can eat a small fish rather than the big one, right? So uh, the next important contaminants are the pollutants are persistent organic pollutants. Here, we, I, I would like to talk only uh, the three important pollutants, that PCBs, OCBs, and then PBDE. For PCB, we monitor 209 congeners compounds, their individual concentration in all lake fish tissues. And for the OCB, 21 different compounds. And for PBDE, um, roughly 30 compounds, but we are mainly interested in uh, five, like P PDE 47 and 99 and so on. So just small intro, how do we extract this chemical? It's interesting because we have to analyze them separately in a different model, different column, different analysis techniques, everything is different. So if we have all of them in one uh, sample, it's very tough to analyze them and quantify them. So we take the fish, uh, the fish tissue and mix with the polyacrylic acid, that's a polymeric material we use to absorb the moisture present in fish, tem fish samples. And then we take that extract, uh, uh, pass through the gel permeation, gel permeation chromatography, where we get it off the lipids. And then we purify those samples using a power preparation system, otherwise called 4% deactivation silica gel. It's a little chemistry over there. And then we also tune the eluents, the solvents what we use, and we get out uh, with the two different fractions. The fraction one will be having only PCBs, and then fraction two will be OCBs with the BBDE. So now it's more simpler than the complicated mixture of samples. So this graph shows the concentration of uh, PCBs and then selected uh, OCPs in PBB in nanogram per gram. And I have highlighted a few lakes and then the year. See, for example, Lake Michigan even and Lake Ontario odd and even. So these sites are highly prone to the industrial effluence. And we do have really uh, high concentration of PCBs and OCBs together. So Lake Erie Valley, uh, yeah. So if you look at the Lake Erie, it's having very low concentration of PCBs and OCBs and PBDE because uh, we only get the lake uh, valley as a predator fish. So this one is having very less uh, lipid content compared to lake trout. So all these pollutants love to stick with lipids. They are lipophilic. So when we have less lipids in the fish, so it has less pollutants. So pick your f uh, fish before, uh, you know, eating that, yeah. And this two graphs shows the trends of uh, PCBs uh, uh, concentration from, I'm not sure, 2005 to 2009. So you could see the PCB, total PCB concentration is decreasing at the rate of 10% per year. That's really, really significant number. And the total uh, OCPs or otherwise the total DDDs decreasing at the rate of 13%. So that is to, uh, that's something uh, we have to take away point. So we have implemented several measures that decrease these PCBs and OCB concentration in fish tissues. So what happens with uh, total PCBs um, in 2020? So what I showed in the previous slide is only 29. So this graph, the histogram shows the concentration of total PCBs uh, in all five Great Lakes. So look at the Lake Michigan. Someone raised the question uh, during the discussion. So what happened to the Lake Michigan tissue? So if you look at Lake Michigan is highly polluted and is having really roughly around 750 PBB of total PCBs. But again, uh, the Lake Superior probably may think it's less polluted. It doesn't, but it's a very big lake and the pollutants are highly diluted. So that's the reason we have less PCBs in that. So this uh, data shows how this PCB concentration trend appears from 2014 to 2020, roughly like 20 to 22%, uh, sorry, 20 to 24 or 25% uh, 
declined or decreased over a year. And for the Lake Erie, it is 45% decreased uh, from 2014 to 2020, because as I mentioned before, it's having less amount of lipids in the fish tissue. So that's the last uh, pollutant what we have been monitoring is the PBD congeners concentration um, from 2000 to 2016. So here we have put them in an order like before 2000, from 2000 to 2007, and then after 2007 to 2016. So that's the order of histogram um, from left to right. So we can clearly see still the Lake Michigan is having high concentration of PBDs. Uh, I haven't put all of them, just only the five, because these are the very important PBDs to be monitored as per the EPA uh, regulatories. So then I wanted to compare um, what's, what's the concentration in 2020. So this is, so if you look at from 2016, so we got roughly like 50 uh, PBB of the PBDs and in Lake Michigan, it was about 50, but now we got even more. That's the main alarming concern. Why from 2016, what happened to 2020, the concentration went up. So I will explain it why in the conclusion. So now <clears throat> the mercury concentration decreased in Lake Michigan, especially in Lake uh, Superior and Michigan, have roughly like three to 5%. Uh, and at the same time, the concentration of uh, mercury in water decreased by 50%, like half. But the concentration of mercury in fish system increases. Why? Because the mercury tends to attach to the particles or sediments rather than staying in atmosphere or in the aquatic water, okay? So that's the reason the concentration of mercury is increasing, even though we put a lot of regulatory form, uh, uh, norms to decrease the mercury emission to the atmosphere. But still we have enough concentration of mercury in the sediment and it's coming to, uh, I mean, getting accumulated on fish tissues and of course ends up on our dining table. The here, the clear water means we have to understand it's, uh, it's not clear, so we have fewer algae. So when we have less algae and they accumulate or consume or store a lot of mercury in it, so then the mercury concentration in planktons, zooplanktons, and then small fishes are high concentration, then the highly polluted are the lakes which are having more algae. The second, PCB and OCB concentration decreased, ranging from 4% to 21% per year. This is reflecting the successful historical and ongoing reduction of fugitive releases by EPA and other federal norms. That's the important point, we should appreciate it. And the total PCB will remain primary concern in the future because the substantial mass of PCBs and their second uh, slowest or smallest decline trends what we observed over 20 years. So we have to follow still this total PCB concentration in all fish tissues. The last one is the PBDE. As I mentioned, the PBDE concentration still increasing, uh, as I showed in the previous slide, because the PBDEs are polyluminated diphenyl ethers. So the main reason is we got PBDE 209, which was synthesized till 2014 and used till 2020. So those chemicals are still there in our aquatic system and in the environment. So that will take at least another a decade or two to completely get rid of all the PBDEs. Because those PBDE 209 will debrominate and give all this uh, PBDE 45, 99, 100, 104, and so on, several other congeners. So with this, um, I would like to uh, thank our funding agency, EPA, and the captain, Pop, and crew of the, the Lake Guardian. So here and our colleagues and uh, uh, the graduate students in CARES at Clarkson University. So I'm up to the questions. Thank you. I missed you, sorry. So, 
Yes. 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 Yeah, so it's good. Actually, we are not getting Lake uh, Trout in Lake Erie. That's the reason we are not able to quantify the concentration. So in Lake Erie, we only get the main predator fish, Lake Valley. So it, it's not the, uh, the, the lake. It also depends on the fish type how the mercury is getting accumulated there. Because the mercury and other pollutants are lipophilic, so if you have more fat, so they try to get accumulate more faster. And also age of the fish is important. Um, I, I can uh, I cannot say that the exact numbers the distance, but we uh, have some database, so the the mercury vapor can be transported even to 200 miles easily. Yeah. So and there are several uh, stations they monitor the gaseous mercury concentration till it's uh, in under surveillance, and they predict that easily 50 to 100 miles definitely they go uh, and deposit on the aquatic uh, layers. Yeah.